Hey readers and writers, I'm Adrian Buskey, and you're watching Fictitious, a show about the storytelling craft of science fiction and fantasy. In this episode, I'm talking with Cass Morris, author of Give Way Tonight, the sequel to the historically inspired fantasy from Unseen Fire. This series, called The Oven Cycle, explores a Roman-esque empire filled with divine and elemental magics, dangerous political machinations, and rising war between cultures and territories. Several years of harsh dictatorship have unbalanced the powerful city of Avon, but now the dictator is dead and the resulting power vacuum draws in the late ruler's allies and enemies to struggle for control of the Republic. Latona of the Vitilii is a mage of spirit and fire, married off to a minor, indifferent noble to keep her life and talents free of notice. But with the dictator finally gone, Latona and her canny, gifted siblings can throw off the objections of society to seize a greater destiny for their people. Sempronius Terran is an exiled but ambitious senator seeking influence in Avin. But in a political system that refuses office to those who possess magical talent, he hides a dangerous secret, a blessing from the gods that shows him shadows of possible futures. Conjoined by politics, complicated by romance, Latona and Sempronius must work together to protect the Republic. But can cunning wit and divine magic stand strong against foes that wield brutal violence and wicked sorcery? Give Way Tonight is the second novel in the Oven Cycle series and is available December 29th from Daw Books. And Cass, welcome to Fictitious. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Something that's been an interesting thing as I've been doing this show is the fun part for me is not just talking to authors I enjoy, but finding people that I have known as almost like social media presences before <laughs> um, I knew them as authors or encountered their work. And you're one of those people. Um, I think that if you kind of get into book Twitter, you find, you know, circles that talk to each other and, and uh, communicate and are opinionated or have interesting views and have stuff. <laughs> um, and so I have run into you as a person in the social media sphere for a long time. Uh, and so I've really been interested in getting you on the, the show for quite a while. I want to really kind of dig into these books. And I, I'll make a note that um, Giveaway Tonight is, like I said at the top, is a sequel. This is not a spoiler show. You know, we dig into the craft of, of how you make these books. But I also know for a lot of people, this is going to be their introduction to a story. So I don't want to ruin too much about it by giving away kind of what happened with the first one. So I think mm -hmm. we're going to talk kind of um, more broadly about the series and the main characters and, and sort of the influences. So first off, um, I want to know what's your elevator pitch? How do you describe these novels and this series to people? The standard one-line response I usually have is, I gave the ancient Romans magic to see what they would do with it, and it was wonderful and terrible things. <laughs> As we That's might great. predict from the Romans, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if you know anything of the Roman history, for sure. If you give them even m more power or more influence or uh, a new tool, then, yeah, things were going to go horribly awry, but all, f all the fascinating ways. So, yes, that makes perfect sense. And I really, really want to dig into that kind of Roman influence. And I have some very specific questions about that and how that falls into genre and stuff. But we'll come back to that. First thing I want to ask is um, I, I, like to, I like to tackle the heavy stuff first. Thematically... Um, I'm always interested in the writer's journey as far as how a series starts, how a book starts. Um, you know, is it a character, is it a world that springs to mind as a setting that they want to explore, or is there a thematic that they want to explore? I feel like there are some authors that dive into things and immediately, like, they, they have, thematically, they want something they want to really dig into, that they have something to say. And other times, they just have a story they want to tell, and they discover the themes along the way. Usually, it's probably a blend of the two, but I'm curious for you, what that was like with the Oven Cycle, you know, what were you kind of setting out to explore with these stories and what did you find along the way? Yeah, absolutely. I would say it, it's definitely a blend for me. I begin with character. That is pretty much always how any story I, I work on begins is with a sense of a character. In this story, it is specifically the Vitellii sisters, Latona and her sisters, Aula and Alhina, who came to me. I was looking for something to work on. I, I was trying to come up with ideas. I sort of thought I wanted to do something Roman flavored, 
Um, this was back in 2011. I was getting ready for uh, NaNoWriMo that year and was trying to sort of, you know, whittle out what my project was going to be. And I was just looking through some different websites. I think it may have actually scrolled past me on Tumblr or something. Hmm. This painting called The Baths of Caracalla by Lawrence Alma Tadema. And it's a beautiful painting. It's neoclassical. And it's in, you know, the Roman baths. So there's people frolicking in various states of undress in most of the picture. But in the foreground are these three women sitting on a bench. And one of them is leaning in very like, I have something exciting to tell you. And she's got this sort of mischievous expression. And then in the middle, there's this woman sort of leaning back like, I don't know. Are you sure about this? I think you might be having me on. And the third girl is sort of like intrigued, but a little scandalized at the same time. And that was where the three sisters sprang into my head. And then I had to find out what are they gossiping about? What are their secrets? What do they care about? And that is when the whole world sort of started building itself around them and what they what they hold dear to their hearts. It turned into from there both personal and political themes. On the personal side, Latona is a character who is someone who has made herself small, even though she has a great deal of natural power. But the world has not valued that power. Sometimes that power is seen as threatening to, to certain some segments of society, and she has to negotiate that. And for me, that was a very personal story. There's a lot in it about recovering from trauma and taking up the space you deserve in the world. So that's sort of the personal theme in the books. And then politically, it's about a nation fighting for its soul and deciding who are we going to be as a people from, from here out. And the tensions in the book are drawn both from history and from the modern day. I'll say, when I began this work, I didn't realize some of them were going to be quite as pointed as they ended up being. Right. But yeah. there, there is a lot about, do we care about our neighbors or are we isolationist? Do we care about diversity? Do we want to welcome in new ideas and new opinions? Or do we want to stick to how we've been doing things all along? And that is very much um, at the end of the Roman Republic was a big question for them. And it's certainly something we tangle with today. And I really love dissecting the various viewpoints that play into those ideas. I like that you mentioned that um, that sort of uh, clinging hard to tr traditionalist ideas. There's an antagonist who appears like right at the beginning of the first novel and is very clear in his own narrative that the the old ways are what matter. That's is what, you know, he wants to absolutely reinstate like at, you know, kind of almost any cost. It, there are really interesting parallels to our current society with, you know, that that fight between the people who want to regress to something, some, you know, some ideal of a, of a pastime that doesn't really exist except for in mm -hmm. sort of a collective fiction versus a, you know, modern day society that's trying to figure out how to evolve and improve itself. So yeah, there's a lot of parallels in there. Also, I mean, this, this story takes in uh, like a sort of a patriarchal society where like the fathers sort of dictate, you know, mm -hmm. who their daughters marry. And, you know, a lot of people are being put into places for political means, not necessarily because they're smart matches or because there's actual love there. Politically, it's, it's very masculinely dominated, but even some of the men are pushed out because they have uh, magical abilities and things too. So there's a lot of societal restrictions and, and strictures to like kind of, you know, put up with in here uh, as people try to figure out, like you said, how, how, how the, they're allowed to take up space in their own way um, and influence that world. So I felt like there was there was a lot to tackle there. I do love though that you that it came right out of a painting. I love a good origin story where somebody can pinpoint. <laughs> I looked at this and the story started here. I absolutely love that. Another thing that I've been talking a lot more about on this show lately um, is trope, and I almost feel like it's kind of a dirty word, uh, but. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting thing to me that the the modern reader, especially the like, hyper book connected one that lives on BookTube or in Goodreads or in, you know, archive of our own or things like that, they understand trope in a way that I think previous audiences didn't. They can identify them. They have names for them. They have devotions to very specific ones. And even in the marketing now, sometimes I'm getting publicist emails that are like, here's the book and here's the nine tropes that it hits. So if you like, yeah. you know, only one bed or enemies to lovers or whatever those things are – you know, it's it's all in here. From your standpoint going into it, are there sort of recognizable tropes that you you know or you, you can kind of pinpoint in this story? What's your own relationship with trope? Did you think about those things even as you were starting the story? That kind of stuff. Sort of. I I think of myself, I started out as a fanfic writer, as I think a lot of authors of my generation did. 
that's where I learned. That's where I grew up. I love fanfic. I think it's a beautiful act of creation. And I also think that if you want to write professionally, it's good training grounds because that's where you can really get some feedback and get people telling you like this works, this doesn't, which can sometimes be hard when you're writing original things. I didn't consciously sort of think about building tropes into the story, though. I think more in terms of who the characters are, which isn't always directly aligning with what tropes I think they might echo. I think we see a bit of friends to lovers, sort of. Latona is a girl on fire in a lot of ways. Um, <laughs> she's a woman on fire. She's not, you know, she's not the, the teenage dystopian version of that trope, which is where we often see it. But she has sort of those those powers and and that aspect to her personality as well. There's a lot of the the woman in the queenly mask aspect to her as well. I think that she has to put on this exterior expression of having it all together and not letting her emotions go. And that's a lot of where her tension comes from is that she sort of wants to, but can't. So I see a little bit of those in her, certainly. It's such a weird thing to talk about because I think as a writer, you're dealing with all kinds of levels of craft and figuring things out, but you don't necessarily set out to be like, I'm going to tell this tale. You discover along the way, you're like, oh, I hit that thing. Um, And then I feel like there are a lot of writers now that are more, and particularly I think this hits in in a lot of the indie circles where they know that they're sort of attacking certain audiences where they're like, well, I know certain audiences love amnesia tropes, so I'm going to Mm -hmm. write the amnesia trope story, or I'm going to do this thing because I know that there is an Amazon sub genre that is, you know, underserved and that I can get a number one bestseller because it's orphan fiction, which is where Harry Potter lives permanently or something <laughs> like that in Amazon. So I don't know. It's it's a, it's an odd world. And I always think it's an interesting thing to explore. It's probably also hard to talk about something you started working on in, in 2011 and, yeah. you know, and <laughs> how those things developed over time. Because, you know, nine years later, it's a very different world, which is a, a frightening thing to kind of realize, like how much has changed in just a short period. But circling back around to the world. So we hit that it's it's Roman inspired, um, you know, clearly right out of the uh, you know artwork that related to it but also it seems like this is a heavily researched you know very informed by actual historical types of so social structures, city structures, mm-hmm. political stuff. I want to dig into that but my first like I feel like the hard hitting question here is do you think this is an alternate history with magic or is this a fantasy world inspired by history? I ask that because for me, I don't know that it matters, but it really matters to some readers and some reviewers out there um, who get really, really hung up on the difference between the two. And so I'm curious what your take is on that. It is absolutely an alternate history with magic. The map is our world. The history is more or less our world. It is a version of our world where magic shaped events as much as warfare and politics and law. That's the big difference. And, and I have in my head some key moments that that change. The founding of the city is sort of the biggest one that's relevant for the story. But it is definitely of our world. The changes I've made have been to integrate magic and to think about how would a society built on these same bones use magic. But you don't see historical figures directly as analogs in in this tale. You will see people who maybe look a little bit like them. Sempronius Terran began as a very Julius Caesar type character, in early drafts, he has become much less of that as I wanted to like him better (laughs) and and made him a different, he is, he now has sort of more in common with Tiberius Gracchus, who was a late Roman Republic reformer. Um, He was very much a popular politician who wanted to do a lot of land reforms and what we would now call social justice, honestly, in a lot of ways. Um, And so Sempronius is very much influenced by him, but you're not going to see exactly historical figures in, in the series. It's funny you mention about certain readers and reviewers getting hung up on that because I had some very funny reviews of From Unseen Fire that were like, she didn't even try to hide the Roman influence. And I was like, well spotted. <laughs> I did not, in fact. <laughs> That's how I advertise it. Um, it's like, good job. You picked up on that. I'm proud of you. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's like, thanks, Captain Obvious. You really, you really caught it. But <laughs> cool. But yeah, that, that's the thing that's always fascinating to me about, um, I've, I've talked about this with other authors on the show, but like, uh, you know, I've been on Goodreads for a time out of mind, but I never really lived there, which was sort of a thing in kind of the background. Um, when I jumped into YouTube, I had to kind of become aware of BookTube and how people talked about things. And I was not surprised to find that readers have opinions, uh, but I was <laughs> surprised to find sort of the granular nature of so many of those things where like b- labels and categorizations and stuff like that do really seem to matter 
matter to people and and they do get really hung up on on some of that stuff uh i do think in looking at this world like you said i mean it uh, oven is is the stand-in for rome so you, you have changed the names on a lot of things but there um i want to say that at some point you do mention like the like the myth of of uh is it remulus and romulus kind of the classic the yes. sort of origin story of rome yeah. um but clearly that it's not called rome so it kind of exists in this world but it, there's a divergence point with the magic so um well i'm glad we've cleared that up we can hit that right there and be like <laughs> if the question is answered people it is right here we have done it we've, we've done the hard-hitting questions what i do wonder a lot when approaching historical fiction i ask this this question sometimes in relation to people who write science fiction like things that take place on starships or fantasy worlds that are kind of you know more traditional sword and sorcery kinds of things readers coming into these things now are typically already sort of entrenched in some version of these kinds of worlds right like you if you put somebody on a starship you rarely have to really explain the faster than light unless it's hard sci-fi and people really care about the perceived science within the story if they're going into a sword and sorcery world they want to know how the magic system works but they kind of get the gist of it in general unless you're really upending the you know the platform with something like this when you're basing it on a well-known historical era how much are you expecting the audience to bring with them to the narrative. So when they come in the door, you know, do they have this? Because I'll, I'll say this is as somebody who you know, I studied a little bit of Roman stuff in college, you know, and I, you know, I saw Gladiator. I like, you know, I have like some of those kinds of ideas, yeah. <laughs> but I'm not super well informed about that era um, and say like the architecture or the political structures and stuff. So I'm kind of coming in a little blind on some of it. A lot of other people are coming in. They're like, well, that was my master's degree. And uh, and so I have feelings <laughs> about this. How much are you leaning on the audience to bring in and how much of it do you have to kind of dole out with exposition and, and details? What is your job to deliver that uh, to the audience? It's an interesting balance to strike because I think especially with ancient Rome, you get a sense of what people think they know about the period, which is not necessarily correct or accurate. So sometimes it's a matter of correcting assumptions that the reader might have. I can rely like a great deal on their knowledge of the aesthetic, you know, what the clothes look like. I, I can sort of assume they know what a toga looks like. Where I have to do some work sometimes is, to use the toga as an example, not everyone wore that all the time. The toga was your business suit. You wore that for certain purposes. And there were different kinds of toga you wear for different purposes. But when you're just at home hanging out, you're not hanging out wearing 12 yards of wool <laughs> wrapped <laughs> around you. It's not comfy. That's not good to wear at a dinner table. You'd be wrestling the sheet around you the entire time. And so correcting that sort of thing that you think the world looks like this. Actually, it was more like this. Uh, one area that gets really interesting is in the area of diversity. I think we think of the aesthetic of the ancient world as being very white, influenced by lots of BBC dramas and things like that. Right. When it wasn't. The ancient Mediterranean was a wildly diverse place, and Rome especially was a nexus for so many different civilizations and traders and merchants passing through and enslaved people being brought in. And it looked much more like a modern cosmopolitan city than I think a lot of us assume before we sort of peel back the assumptions given to us by other media and really dig into what what it was and what it looked like. And so that's something I've tried to stress in the book is what a multi multicultural place it was. I, you hit on something really good there is that um, when you're fighting sort of the audience expectations of things that they've built on from a lot of whitewashed history. Uh, there's, you know, so many things that, that especially white culture has grown up with this idea that like, well, European history is just cracker white, like forever. And it just wasn't much like if you trust TV procedurals to teach you about like how like the human body handles a bullet or how, you know, police work <laughs> works and you'll be wrong. You can't trust fiction all the time to tell you the truth of a situation. So it's a good note. What was your own research background doing? Like, I mean, trying to get those elements right. Do you have kind of an, a, um, an educational background in this? Is this something you explored more as just a personal interest? How did that work? I have a semi-academic background in the classics. I, I took Latin growing up. I studied some in undergrad. I almost had an accidental classics minor. My, I was English and history, but I took so many classics courses that I, I was like one or two classes short of having a second minor in the classics uh, because I just, I love it. I've always been fascinated by Rome and the ways in which it is at once familiar to us and yet alien in a lot of its worldviews. I like the tension between those those two concepts. And then when I knew I was going to be writing this book, I did a lot more individual research. And I especially looked for good social history, a 
about Rome. What did the people live like? Not just what was the political rise and fall and when did Caesar do a thing and when did they have battles, but what were the people in the city living like? What were their buildings like? What was their day like? And there are some wonderful, wonderful books out there that dig so deep into that because so much work has been done, so much archaeology has picked up the pieces of these people's lives and been able to reassemble them. And so that's what I really spent a lot of time dwelling in before I launched into fully writing the, the manuscript. I like that you touched on the sort of the everyday lives of people. We get used to seeing the drama, but not necessarily the mundane aspects. Early on, you introduced this idea of like prescription, which was like uh, the the dictator has kind of found his rivals, anybody who's spoken out against him, even in a very mild way and is either having those people killed or more or less like creating a list of people that are on the list to get whacked. And, uh, and those people have to flee the city and basically take themselves. It's not exactly exile, but it's essentially that because they have to go live far enough outside of the city that they're not quite under the thumb that they can operate. Um, whether they take a, a military post that's, uh, that's very dangerous and, and you no, know, not something everybody would want to do, but it keeps them from being directly just killed off by the strong men of the dictator, or they're like languishing on an estate somewhere, um, where they're outside of political influence, um, and just kind of biding their time until the dictator finally drops dead. Is that something, the idea of prescription, um, and also you talk a lot about the, sort of the division between patrician and plebeian, um, you know, hierarchical mm -hmm. states, like, is that stuff that's kind of pulled right from history and from the, the you know, the Roman side of things? Like, how did, how did that work and how that influenced this? Yeah, a lot of that comes straight out of the history. The prescriptions were used by dictators during the Republic, like Sulla and Caesar. Uh, Mark Antony was very big on it. And it was useful because if you legally prescribed someone, you could murder them without consequence and then take all their cash. Uh, so it's a great thing to do if you're a dictator who needs funds. And then the, the emperors in the imperial period did that from time to time as well. So that absolutely has historical precedent. Um, my, my dictator, Ocella, is based somewhat on Sulla in the late Republic period. And the patricians and plebeians, it was a major distinction in Rome earlier in the Republic. By the late Republic, it was still a known thing. It was a little more social. It no longer had quite the same heavy sense of, of class distinction. How much money you had by that point was, was much more important to what you could get done. But it was still something sort of people knew about. And the patricians were more likely to be the wealthiest because they had accumulated so much wealth and done a good job protecting their wealth. And they were likely to be sort of the celebrities of the day. So it wasn't impossible, certainly. There were lots of plebeians by the late Republic that were consuls, were military leaders, were important, were wealthy. But there was still something of an awareness of the distinction between them. Well, there ain't no money like old money. So, um, yeah. yeah so. It's very it's very much an old money sort of idea. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we've been pretty academic uh, with a yeah. lot of that <laughs> stuff. So let's, let's dig into the fantasy part. Let's talk magic. Uh, I, I think if... Um, it's become useful to use like D and D uh, terminology when talking about uh, magic systems, at least for me, because I'm a game master. So that's how I think. So as you know, in some systems you have arcane magic, uh, you know, literally the magic of wizards and sorcerers, and then uh, other times you have divine magic, magic that's pulled from the gods. This is very much a world where there is uh, a lot of divine influence in the magic, and uh, you know, have a pantheon, so you have a really broad group of gods to pull from mm. and multiple blessings might be bestowed on an individual. What can you kind of tell me about this magic system, how this works, how the blessings work? There's a lot to dig into because I mean, you have like things that feel very elemental, but then you have like fracture magic, which is like a whole other thing mm. uh, unique to this. So, um, you know, give us the kind of the 10 story overview of how this works. Yeah. So the magic, I think of it as elemental magic. It just goes beyond the sort of normal four or five elements you tend to see in, in a lot of systems. And the magical system is one that I'd been developing for a long, long time outside of this project. Even it, it goes back to games and role-playing things I did as a teenager <laughs> and has sort of shifted and evolved over time. So when I was starting this project, I went, well, that system's as good as any, and I've thought about it a lot, so let's move it into this project. <laughs> and in doing so, I melded it with the Roman pantheon and the idea of polytheism, because to the Romans... Magic was real. They they very firmly believed in it. There were sometimes laws, but more often social guidelines around, you know, when you could use what kinds of magic. And cursing someone was perfectly acceptable if they had done you a wrong. We have so many examples of Roman curse tablets that have survived, and they are fascinating to read. They are so 
petty a lot of the time. <laughs> and it's a real window into, oh, it was a different world, but people are still people. And you're going to curse somebody because they might have stolen your ring, maybe. <laughs> Fascinating things like that. So I, I blended that idea and decided that, at least from the perspective of people living in Avon, magical gifts are bestowed by the gods. And different gods rule different elements. And you might be blessed with two. This sort of gets into some of the, the mythos around it that more than that is unknown of in, in modern times, at least. Maybe demigods might have had more than, than two powers bestowed upon them. And the way the magic works is usually by invoking the deity in some fashion, asking the deity for help, guide me in this magic, which would be a very familiar thing for really anyone sort of in, in the classical Mediterranean. The gods were part of their lives in a way that I think is unusual from um, our modern perspective. They were real. You, you talked to them all the time. And for the Romans, it was very transactional. I will do this for you if you do this for me, which I love. I think that's a fascinating way to approach deity. But it also draws from what is around you. Um, so we have the, the sort of tangible elements, earth, air, fire, and water, and then the intangibles, light and shadow, time, spirit, and fracture. So those are still things we witness in the world around us, but not necessarily things it's as easy to you know, lay your hands on and touch. And the tangible elements are more common. That is a more common magical power to have. And there are sort of two main deities governing each element. But then because the Roman pantheon is massive, there are tons and tons of other deities as well. And so you might have been blessed by one particular minor deity as opposed to one of the, the big guys. I just sort of like playing with that because it allows me to play with different ways each element can manifest. You know, the element of earth can be fertility and growing, and it can be the goddess carries, and it can be fields of bounty. It can also be Diana. It can be the wild forest and wild animals and things that are untrammeled and can't be contained in a garden or a field. It can be stone. It can be rock. It can take a lot of different forms. And so I, I enjoyed how ascribing the magic to different deities let me have that sort of freedom in interpretation. Gosh, that's that's such a, a lot of ground to cover. Um, as far as I mean, well, I mean, even just I mean, you know, I I did study like um, uh, classic Greek and Roman mythology in college again millions of years ago. Um, but you're just tracking the pantheon and figuring out like the hierarchy of gods and all those influences yeah. and the different things that they they hold sway over and the ones that have you know a little bit of a hand here and a finger in this one and stuff like that. Like mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. yeah, it's a, it's a lot to go with. I mean, you talked about having these sort of like tangible elemental magics, but there are several characters that have some level of kind of prophetic ability um, in their blessings. Uh, Sempronius is a character who has this dark mirror that he gazes into and calls upon the gods and they kind of show him multiple visions of the future. Latona has a younger sister who has um, not so much prophecy as so much as a uh, uh, and perhaps that's in there too, but like, uh, but you know, a way of seeing the immediate future or seeing or sc almost scrying, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. seeing symbols that tell her other things are happening. Like she becomes aware that the dictator is dead before anybody else has been, you know, been told about it. I'm always interested from the standpoint of crafting a narrative, particularly long narratives, you know, if you're over a trilogy, the impact of having characters who have prophecy, because when you once you write that into a story, you have to fulfill it, right? It's like introducing the gun in the second act. You have to fire it. It seems like the kind of thing that like in a singular book, no problem because you've got one novel. As over a series, then suddenly you're trying to fulfill things that you've written quite a bit earlier and that could introduce its own challenges. So I want to know your approach to writing prophecy if you ran into any of those challenges within this uh, while you've been constructing this narrative. That's a fantastic question. It's something no one's ever asked me before. So you're going to get sort of an exclusive secret here which is that, yes, I did once absolutely write myself into a corner. And I was fortunately able to shift it in a way that worked. So broadly, my approach to prophecy is usually to keep it vague when I can. Symbols. And, and so that's why both Sempronius and Alhina, when they have visions or when he's looking in his dark mirror, what they see isn't literal. It is symbolic. It's open to interpretation. And, you know, to quote the great master Yoda, always in motion is the future. And so it can still change. <laughs> Alhina, particularly, tends to see more short-term. She is seeing not as far into the future. And she is also still very young. She's still getting a grasp on her gifts, so she doesn't always know what to do with what she's seen. Sempronius's shadow magic gives him a longer view, but it's much less specific. And that is where I wrote myself into a corner once, because <laughs> I introduced his prophecy. It's, it's, I think it's in his first chapter in From Unseen Fire, and he has a vision of three challenges he has to face. 
And the first one, he, he sets to facing within the first book. The second one is the one that it is no longer what I thought it was going to be when I initially wrote it. Just because in examining the structure of the series, I had to change what happened when and in what order and how that all gets untangled. I was able to, in, in books two and three, you'll be able to see this, the iconography fits, but it is not what I initially intended, <laughs> that second <laughs> challenge of his to be. And I'm actually, I'm working on book three right now, and I sort of just wrote a scene where he sort of reasons that out to himself. And it's like, yeah, that was definitely not just the author fixing a problem she created for herself. <laughs> and the third one, the third challenge he sees, I will eventually be working my way to. And that's sort of, that's a fixed point that I know I can get to, but it was that second one that got me in trouble. It's like, okay, I said this thing, so I have to fix it. And I did. I found a way that satisfies me and probably readers will not really note unless they listen to this and watch this. And then they'll have the <laughs> The secret inside info. Like it's the behind the scenes uh, thing where you have to figure out how a narrative shifted over time because that's just what happens. I mean, I think, it does. you know, a uh, plan doesn't survive the battlefield. Um, <laughs> you know, the long term idea for a story doesn't survive a trilogy unscathed because it's always going to develop its own mind as things go along. But also, I think a prophecy is interesting to explore because, uh, you know, there's a reason why we have the phrase self-fulfilling prophecy, because a lot of times when people are presented with something, it then shapes their own idea of their own narrative of where their life is going, how they're going to handle things, because they've been told this is what you're going to be. And the response from a, a normal human being is either to go, oh, I must go fulfill my destiny or to go, no, oh, hell with that. Like I have personal agency. I'm not doing that thing. Right. In societies, uh, and particularly magical societies where prophecy holds that weight of magic and holds that weight of, of belief behind it, uh, that, you know, affects characters in different ways. You also have this character, this war King, um, this young mm. man coming up in a society outside of Avon that has a completely different culture, has a completely different approach to magic. And, um, and early on in the narrative, he is kind of going, gone from being a respected warrior to being sort of labeled via their, you know, magical elders as this new war king, as the person who will lead them into battle and, and greatness. What's the role for this character? And I'm not saying his name because I can't pronounce it. Uh, <laughs> but um, but what is his role and, and, and how does prophecy play into the nature of their magic and their society? So his name is Ikialdi. He's Iberian. So that is modern day Spain. It was in the, Republic, the Roman Republic being provincialized. Um, the people who lived there were Celt-Iberians. We don't know a lot about them. So this is a place I had both more freedom to create and the challenge of much less historical um, basis to go on. So I sort of, I, I threw together some things based a little bit off of what we do know about the Celt-Iberians and some other Celtic groups, and then sort of what functions I needed the narrative to fulfill. Their magic is more directly nature-based, the way rivers move, uh, sort of movement is a big thing for, for their system. It's not as codified as the Aventon system because they are not people who write things down in the way that the way that our Aventons do. For Ikialdi, the, the element of prophecy comes in. He's 20 years old, and the magic men of his tribe say, the god has chosen you. You have a divine destiny now. He takes it upon him and runs with it and has really decided that even when he sort of feels a bit of moral quandary about what he's doing, he just says, but the gods have chosen this, so I have to push through and keep doing this thing. Which is, I think, really just, he's a really interesting character in that he wants to be doing something that is good, and he sort of runs himself into into very dark places to follow that goal. There's a, a moment early on where one of the elders, when they first kind of, like, drop this big thing on him, this label, this, you know, uh, this name, it's noted as being sort of a rare thing um, within their culture to be designated so. But the elder kind of says, you will be doing the will of the gods, but in tandem your choices are the will of the gods. And so that's what I think is, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if I'm explaining it well here, but like, it's that idea of, you know, yes, you have been chosen to do this thing. And so you're f fulfilling this, this prophecy, but at the same time, your choices, like they have picked you to make those choices. There is a sense yeah. of agency. There is a sense of like, well, you know, it, it's your job to decide what that means. That's kind of where you figure out that sort of branch of being like, oh, I follow blindly or I make those decisions because I was empowered to make those decisions to try to to do the right thing and for a character to try to figure out like well what that is going forward is a lot of moral quagmire which is the best type of quagmire right yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> uh it's worth noting here uh, th this book has a big cast 
um, or this series sure has does. a big cast. There's a lot of characters, um, and it's a lot of characters also in a uh, in a Roman esque era where you have a lot of names that um, end with much like Sempronius, Anesses, and Icuses, or, or you know kinds of kind of things in there because that was a nature of the that world and and their own naming system. How are you tracking all of them? When I think about keeping track of characters, keeping track of names, keeping track of the the individual events that affect all of them. Over one novel can be a lot with a big cast. Over a trilogy, that is daunting. Uh, so I want to know, mm-hmm. pure craft, like how are you tracking those characters? How are you managing that across revisions? Are you getting points where you're like, oh, I'm in the second book and like, oh, there's a character I didn't pay off with something in the background that I need to look at? You know, How has that worked for you? Balance is a is a big struggle with a large cast. And I have often made fun of myself for, you know, in my debut series, swinging for the fences in this way. I love large casts. When I read, I love a large cast. I like A Song of Ice and Fire for that reason. I like the Cushiel's Legacy books for that reason. You know, those ones are single point of view, but the cast is still massive. I, I love that in fiction. It's not something my brain struggles to, to keep track of, which I know is not true for for all readers. Some people find a large cast difficult, and I have a lot of sympathy for that, and I apologize. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but keeping track of the details, I have spreadsheets. I have spreadsheets to make sure that I don't, you know, make little errors with people's eye color or ages exactly and things like that. I use Airtable, which is an online spreadsheet system that lets you do a lot of different color coding. It's just a little more bells and whistles than an Excel spreadsheet, and it helps me keep those things straight. As far as crafting that balance, though, it is tough. And so when I'm drafting, I am usually mostly focusing on Latona and Sempronius. Those are the two most major characters whose action drives the the plot the most. And then after a first draft, I'll sort of go, ooh, I totally forgot about Alhina for like 200 pages, didn't I? Better <laughs> fix that. <laughs> better go in and make sure I know where she is all the time and find that balance again and sort of look at, I'll do, you know, a chart of like how many point of view scenes we've had from each character and be like, okay, that seems about right. Or nope, totally forgot you again. Let's wedge that back in there. It's something that I find a lot in revision. And I usually have a sense of where they are and what they're doing. I just haven't always found the best way to weave it into the story in a way that makes sense. That isn't sort of feeling like you're getting whacked in the side of the head with a a new plot point. That's like, where did that one come from? It's a process in in revising, but I enjoy it. I like finding out like where do all the lives intertwine? Because that's that's life, right? We don't we don't live in perfect narrative arcs, and not everyone's plot moves at the same pace, which is also a struggle. <laughs> Most of our lives have a lot of supporting yeah. cast members in it. And although we might be a little more isolated than the current time period, most of the time we do have like a, a pretty wide net of people that influence it one way or another. I am always interested in the, I always think of it as dangling participles, the, the pieces of a narrative left over from, from mm-hmm. edits. There's a, I, and I, and I wouldn't say it by name anyway, but I can't remember the book that I got probably like four or five months ago, but I had an advanced reader's copy and I was reading through this book and two thirds of the way through the novel, there was a cast off mention of another character that does not exist anywhere else in the narrative. Oh. And, um, and was clearly just a, you know, a, a piece of the, ed- and again, it's, it's an arc, you know, that you're going to still get a thing that that's getting caught, you know, like little pieces here and there. But I just remember reading this passage and being like, wait, who, what? And they did what? And I like kind of flipped back and forth and I jumped ahead and I was like, who the hell is this? And and by the end of the novel, I was like, no, it's just that's a person who's mentioned one time having done a thing that doesn't appear anywhere in the novel. And it was clearly just an, an artifact of a previous draft, which is kind of hilarious um, in like sort of a literature archaeology kind of way of kind of like yeah. digging away <laughs> at what might have been there before and knowing, you know, what was left on the cutting room floor. But it's terrifying from the standpoint of a writer and a drafter and a reader reading something and suddenly getting kind of thrown out of whack. Um, so, yeah, that's why that stuff like that. I'm always interested in how people track that. You mentioned POV briefly in there. Mm -hmm. This book is from uh, what I would think of as third person omniscient. And maybe that's not entirely accurate. I I think of it as rotating third between a a large number of characters, certainly. What made you choose that particular 
type of POV? Because I'm always interested because like, you know, uh, first person gives you immediate int intimacy. Omniscient gives you like a much greater ability to just kind of tell what's happening and and um, and not be worried about like, a, you know, the confines of a particular viewpoint. So what was what informed your choices as far as POV and what uh, advantages and challenges did that present? I am much more comfortable in third person in general for some reason. Um, I've tried writing first person things and I can I can do it for very short pieces, but I find first person very difficult to sustain over a long work. Um, I'm very impressed by authors who can do that and do that really well because to me, I always feel like I'm leaving out important things if I'm only inside one person's head. What I really like about third person and rotating between different people's viewpoints is that it allows me to show the diversity of thought in a culture and to get inside different kinds of experiences to showcase as many different kinds of people living their lives as I can, rather than having to filter it all through just one viewpoint. And especially because if, if this was going to be a single POV, if it was going to be just one character who's going to be in the first person, it would probably be Latona's. And she, while someone who has a lot of challenges in her life, is also someone who lives in a place of extreme privilege. And that would color every other character. By getting into different heads, I can widen the lens and explore a lot more um, in terms of lived experience, which, like I sort of mentioned before, I really like pulling that aspect out of history, and I like exploring it in in fantasy as well. It just gives me a lot, a lot more I can do in that sense. It's a challenge to write sometimes, and I know it can be a challenge to follow. I had a big problem with head hopping within a scene to begin with. And I've gotten better at, at moderating myself and like, no, no, one person's head at a time. Yeah. <laughs> I think that also comes from thinking sort of cinematically, as I tend to do. My imagination works cinematically. And in film, you can use the camera to show what different people are feeling at a same moment. But in writing, that can be really dicey and it can be disorienting for a reader to jump between people's heads that's been an issue of discipline for me, is sort of keeping to just whose point of view is most important for this moment in time. I really like that you addressed that. I think head hopping is 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 definitely a challenge. I, I really like what you said there about it being the cinematic. Because even in my my own writing, like I like I had something that I started off writing as a comic and then started writing it more of like a screenplay and then tried to jump into fiction. And I kept I ran into that same problem of like cinematically I could just show what I wanted it to be but when I had to bring it down yeah. into individual character POV suddenly there were things I'm like well the the audience needs to see this but they, they can't see this in this moment because it's not through the eyes of my character or not mm -hmm. in their immediate moment whereas like in a comic script or a film script you, you just just change the angle no big deal you know it's it's a different language um but literally you know language on the page but it's a, a, a mental language as far as figuring out how to translate those things so i think that's a really good thing to hit outliner pantser discovery writer how do where do you fall you, uh, <laughs> <laughs> i have had to learn to be more of an outliner than i am instinctively because i'm writing a series and you know your editors sometimes want to know what's coming up <laughs> and i usually have a broad sense when I think about how I write, it is very organic. I think of myself as a planter, as opposed to pantser or plotter or planner or whatever. I have a bunch of seeds, which are, you know, my characters and maybe some plot elements, maybe even little snippets of dialogue that have come to me. And I have some soil, which is sort of what I think of as the world building. That's the the world I'm, I'm, I'm working in and creating in and, and the magic system and things like that. And I scatter the seeds and I tend them and I find out what grows. And sometimes I get what I intended in the place I intended it. That rose bush looks like a rose bush. Good job. Sometimes I thought that was going to be a carrot and instead it's asparagus. Okay, I may or may not be able to work with that. Sometimes seeds I thought would grow don't. They don't thrive. There's not necessarily a reason. It just doesn't end up working. Um, and sometimes they grow too much and I have to trim them back down. And so that's sort of my, my mental construction of of my process. I tend to think more in terms of a timeline than an outline. I know what events need to happen and sort of how much time it will take in the characters' lives for that to happen. I don't always know how many, I almost never know how many chapters that's going to take me to get through. 
I'm absolutely incapable of outlining like that. The chapter breaks are sort of the last thing I put in. I just have to tell the story and then I'll figure out where those breaks go. I mean, that really does make me wonder if you do have <laughs> other, otherwise some other kind of like uh, structural process that you're looking at. I mean, there's a lot of different ones out there, whether it's like Save the Cat or Seven Point System or Rachel Aaron, t you know, 10K to 2K to 10K or uh, three to four act classical structure, all those kinds of things. Is any of that in the business here? Or like you said, are you just putting the story down and then figuring out like how you break it up? That's pretty much it. I, I see what grows and then I make a shape out of it. And sometimes that means rearranging so that I have a good pace going. Sometimes it means trimming things out because they're cool and interesting, but completely extraneous to the shape of the thing I'm trying to create. It is much more something for me that happens after a first draft than early on in the process. You mentioned that you use Airtable and spreadsheets. Uh, what else do you use writing-wise? What other software? Scrivener. I am completely a Scrivener girl. I discovered it, I don't know, a long time ago. I'm eagerly waiting for them to release um, version 3 on Windows. I would like dark mode. That would make me very happy. Scrivener works for me because of the ability to write each scene as its own little sub document and then move them around because like I said I have to do a lot of that I have to do a lot of rearranging and doing that in a word document becomes so complicated and so hard and I lose track of things Scrivener was a godsend when I found that program I love that I can break it up in that way and then reshape it as I need to I also only recently really learned how to use the custom metadata really well to, to track whatever I want to track to track what the date is what the location of the scene is even things like, you know, what side characters appear in this scene? And, and you can do all sorts of things deciding your own custom fields to keep track of. And that, I think, is going to make my editing process somewhat easier in the future now that I know how to do that. Because <laughs> I want to spend quite so much time looking for those details. I love Scrivener. I had no idea about that metadata side of it. Custom so I... metadata, yes. I am going to dig into that probably right after I get done with this interview <laughs> because I need to know what that is and how that works. Um, because, I mean, I absolutely love the software program, but like, you know, there's there's so much under the hood. It's hard to know everything that's there, especially as new versions get released. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's exciting. Uh, I'm going to have to take a look at that immediately. Uh, as we wrap up here, uh, I also want to know for people who are just getting to know you, where should they be finding out more of the books, more about the books? Uh, where should they be following you on social media uh, so they can you know, keep up with you as both a personality and uh, you know, in your career as a writer? Where are you at on all the places? All the places. So my website is CassMorrisWrites.com, and that has the broad information about the books as well as my blog. I also have a newsletter, which goes out more or less quarterly, I would say, um, that you can sign up for on the website. I am at Cassar Morris on both Twitter and Instagram. I am very online, so those are really good places to find me. Uh, I love Twitter. I talk to people on Twitter all the time. I have a great time there. Hell site, though it is. Uh, <laughs> I like it. I think writing Twitter is less of a hell site than the rest of it. <laughs> so if you sort of just stay in my happy little writer Twitter bubble, it's excellent. Um, I also have a Patreon where I do microfiction, behind the scenes, tidbits, and also geeky things like rhetorical analysis and Shakespeare meanderings, because that's the kind of dork I am. And links to that are on my website as well. I am also one third of the podcasting team at World Building for Masochists, where we discuss fantasy world building and how to put together um, all the different facets of your land and the culture. And uh, we have fantastic guests on all the time, people who are much more clever than we are and tell us wonderful things. Well, that's cool. I didn't know anything about that. Um, oh, I'm planning now on you doing do. some, yeah, I'm planning on doing some stuff uh, for this show that's more focused on world building in the future. So I'll probably hit you guys up because I want to, I'm, I'm going to go take a listen to that and, and explore that because, I mean, that's definitely a question I ask a lot on this show and it's a huge part of science fiction and fantasy storytelling. So uh, that's very, very cool. I'll link all those things down in the description so people can, you know, do the YouTube thing and uh, click and link <laughs> and, and explore them. Uh, like I said at the top, um, the sequel giveaway tonight comes out on December 29th. 2020 has been a weird world um, to release books in. Uh, the uh, the first novel uh, from Unseen Fire came out I think in 2018, so it's been a it's you know been a little while in between. Um, what's it like dropping a book right at the end of the year? Like it's like right post Christmas. You counting on those people that have that gift card burden uh, hole in their pocket what I'm afterwards? Hoping. Yes, yeah. I am. I am hoping for those folks. It's it's a weird moment because you're sort of in this limbo when 
the best of stuff for 2020 is over and people are looking ahead to 2021 already. And it's like, wait, no, there's still a week left. <laughs> there's still <laughs> books coming out right now. Please notice. Um, it's a weird moment, but it's festive. It'll be fun. We'll have Twitter parties since we can't have actual parties. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Twitter and Zooms and all those things. And yep. and uh, we'll give you something to look forward to so people can start off the new year uh, with, with a new novel. And when do you do you know kind of the, th the trajectory for the third one when people might be expecting that? I do not at the moment. Um, it will probably be slated after I said I'm, I'm working on the draft now. I'm pretty close to finished. And then once my editor has taken a look at it, she'll be able to tell me how much work we have to do. <laughs> and then gotcha. we'll get, get it on the calendar. Well, awesome. Uh, like I said, uh, the first novel from Unseen Fire is available from Dot Books now. Um, probably actually when this drops, we'll probably be like uh, like two days probably after the the uh, the second novel is out there. So people should be able to check it out now. Again, uh, links to all this stuff in the description below. And uh, Cass, thank you so much for joining me on Fictitious. Thank you for having me. This has been fantastic. Ooh.